check one. It is time for our children's sermon. So, uh, kids, if you want to come and hang out with Miss Christy, and she's going to give our sermon for today. So, y'all come on up. Good morning. I'm sorry that I'm just kind of out of sorts this morning. I brought a quarter to church this morning, and now I can't find it. I'll look for it again later. This reminds me of a story that Jesus once told. There was a woman who had, who had ten coins, and she had lost one. She looked everywhere for that coin, even using a flashlight. <clears throat> Think, when she finds that coin, how happy and joyful she will be. <clears throat> she will tell all of her friends how excited she is that she found her coin. Jesus goes to tell the people that God wants to love us and wants what's best for us. When we mess up or make mistakes, we can always trust that God still loves us and wants us to be found. Today, to help us remember the joy and excitement that the woman and heaven felt, wait, just a minute. I think I feel something in my pocket. It feels round and flat it's my lost quarter. I am so happy and excited that I found it as I wanted to put it in the offering this morning. Today, the children's sermon is being brought to you by the letter Y. Y is for yawn. Y is for yarn. Y is for... I know I had a yellow pen here. Uh, yellow. And also, Y is for yell! So when you see a why this week, remember the joy and excitement when someone doesn't make mistakes anymore, but instead turns toward listening to God. When we get excited about something, many times we want to yell and shout for joy. We know that sometimes we make mistakes. It brings us joy to know that you love us and forgive us when we do. Help us to show others the joy we have in knowing that you love us. Amen. As we approach our time of corporate prayer together this morning, I want to remind you, as always, of those that you will find in the center of your bulletin on the reverse side of the handout from the announcements, um, those in our church um, family and friends who are in need of prayer, whether facing illness or other trials and, and our military as we continue um, to pray for them, especially on a day like today that remembers an event that so many of us would, would love to forget because it... Um, 
changed our world. And if you're over the age of 20, 25, you remember that day um, very well um, when um, those planes struck the towers and everything changed. So we want to um, keep our military in prayer um, as well. So if you would please um, pray with me this morning. Gracious God, increase our doubt. Increase our doubt that war and conflict and argument bring peace. Increase our doubt that science and human intelligence alone can cure the ills of our world. God, increase our doubt that human beings are the controllers of all things. Give us your grace to recognize our mistakes and our arrogance. Give us forgiveness for our foolishness and the power to live as stewards of all that you have given us. Your creation, our communities, our church, and our families. Merciful God, deliver us from the cowardice that dares not to face the truths that you want to show us anew. God, deliver us from the laziness that's content with just half-truths. Deliver us from the arrogance that thinks that we know all truth. May we plead to you, may you give us zeal and fiery commitment for the purpose of grace and love of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who we are supposed to follow and emulate. Almighty God, you have brought us to this place by many roads. And though we may have been unfaithful, you nevertheless have always kept faith with us. Pry us from all of the distractions to which we give ourselves so freely and strengthen our resolve to commit ourselves to the gospel. Counter our desire for status and reputation with an urge to serve to follow the way of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who came not to rule, but to serve. We pray this together as family in the name of Jesus, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Mark Twain once wrote, familiarity breeds contempt in children. And so uh, our lesson uh, is certainly familiar to most people who have spent any time in the church whatsoever, but I hope it, that is not a reason for contempt. Uh, on occasion, it's good for us to review things that we know rather well, because sometimes the better we know something, the easier it is for us to forget it. And uh, our lesson today comes from Luke's Gospel, the 15th chapter, and in that chapter, which some people call the lost chapter, we have a parable about the lost coin, the lost sheep, and finally the lost son, parable of the prodigal son. And we won't talk about that today, but we will talk about the sheep and the coin. And uh, I would invite you, if you would, to hear today's lesson. Now, all the tax collectors 
and sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus. And the Pharisee and the scribes were grumbling, saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So Jesus told them this parable. Which of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over the 99 persons who need no repentance. Or, what woman having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I would guess that there are very few people here that have spent any kind of time in church whatsoever that couldn't tell the story of these two parables. Just if I called on you right now, you could stand up and say it rather quickly. Do not worry. I am not going to do that to you, Drew. But uh, it, it is true that these are fairly familiar to us. And Sometimes familiarity is cloying, and we think we don't need to attend to that. Uh, doesn't garner much interest from us because we're interested in other things, like The Bachelor on TV. I know I set my schedule every week around that <laughs> television show because it's just warms my heart to see the action on the screen, or Joe Millionaire for richer or for poorer, there's, there's a dandy. I think, isn't that the one where the guy goes to Wall Street and tries to get a job? I have no idea. Or, have you ever seen this show, My Mom, Your Dad? Sounds like my old neighborhood. Anyway, um, if we tell the truth, a sheep and a coin don't really hold much interest for we sophisticated 21st century people who like Joe Millionaire, whoever he is, or The Bachelor, whoever it is. Uh, we're interested in bigger game and bigger issues. Now, these parables are fairly simple. Often in Jesus' parables, they are very simple. Uh, the next few weeks, we have some parables coming up that are not that simple. They're kind of complicated in some ways. But these two, the sheep and the coin, are really pretty simple. The first one tells about a shepherd who brilliantly notices that out of a hundred sheep, one is gone. I, I don't know how he did this, but he is a professional, so maybe that's how he knew that one of them was missing. And so he goes to find it. And somebody says, well, how does a sheep in the middle of a hundred other sheep get lost? And... Uh, this sheep gets lost like people get lost. He just, he eats off of this clump of grass and he's still hungry and he goes to the next clump of grass. Then he goes to the next clump of grass and then he goes to the next one. 
and he just keeps eating his way until he finally looks up to see where everybody is, and he's all by himself. He's eating himself into being lost. And so his master, the shepherd, goes and sees him far off, and he gets him, and he flips him up over his shoulders. We've all seen that painting of Jesus with the sheep around his shoulders, taking him to safety. And uh, so when the shepherd gets back, he calls his shepherding colleagues together, and they all rejoice because he's found this one sheep that was, that was lost. Now you wonder about the people that have employed him as a shepherd, someone that would leave 99% of the stock that they had to go and find 1%. Doesn't sound like a wise way to do business, but that's part of the reason for Jesus' parable. Likewise, as Christy shared with us today, there was a woman who uh, misplaces a coin. She had 10 coins. Why she didn't keep them together, I do not know, but she lost one of them, and it was probably a drachma, which is uh, a, uh, the pay for a day's laborer in the first century. I don't know what you make in a day, but that's the equivalent of what it is. And um, so she's very distraught. That was probably for uh, an older woman who lived by herself a great deal of money. And so she lights her lamp. I, um, I suppose she goes into the corners, these dwellings of people in the first century uh, were difficult to build, first of all, so they didn't have windows, a lot of architecture. There were a window or two, but not that much light came in, so it was very dark in there day and night. So she takes this lamp, and she goes from corner to corner. She finally finds the coin. And so she calls her neighbors together, and, and she says, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I lost. And, uh, and we would think that you'd have to be something of a simpleton to rejoice over one coin or one sheep. But that is what the point that Jesus is trying to make with these parables. Um, in fact, from an economic point of view, searching for these two items is probably more costly and the party that ensued from that than it was to just lose the things in the first place. But uh, it, it's, it's foolhardy, to, foolhardy to abandon 99 sheep to go find one or uh, to be so concerned about one coin that you forget everything else on your day's agenda just uh, to find it. And... Uh, all we know is that these two parables we understand from the point of conventional human wisdom. But when Jesus told uh, these parables, he was doing something else. And I suspect that we all would guess there was more to this than just finding these items. Uh, First of all, for Jesus, I think uh, these parables come out of the context of the grumbling Pharisees and uh, the, uh, the grumbling uh, religious authorities. Have you ever heard anybody grumble lately about anything? You ought to be sitting in my office for a while then, because it's, uh, we like to, I put down grumble strips, right, in front of my door so I can hear people coming. But uh, grumbling just wears on you. It's just, it's just a downer. Uh, always complaining about something, no matter what it is 
my uh, grandfather was a farmer in northern Missouri, and uh, grumbling was his uh, spiritual gift. <laughs> too much rain, not enough rain, too hot, too cold, too March. It, it didn't really matter what it was. He would find a way to complain about these things. And so the Pharisees, uh, the religious authorities, the scribes and others, all they did was they grumbled about stuff. This time they were grumbling because Jesus ate with the wrong people. We do not approve of you breaking bread with sinners and tax collectors. They're off limits. So Jesus told these stories because he is trying to help people understand that in God's kingdom, things don't operate like they do in Bell County or in Texas or in the United States or even in the world. In God's kingdom, in the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, there is a sort of a, a different perspective and a different way to look at things and to look at people. And so Jesus is saying, if there is one person who is saved, who comes into God's kingdom that was out of it, there is much rejoicing. People, come together. Let us celebrate this. And so to counteract this grumbling, Jesus tells these uh, parables that uh, when God restores a sinner, there will be a great heavenly celebration. Now that does not mean that the 99 are of no account. Jesus never says that. He just says there will be a celebration for the one that was lost. Or for the 10 coins. The other nine, perfectly good coins. But the one that we find that was lost, that's the one that people are very happy about seeing. Um, so if I was going to say one thing about the biblical interpretation or the theological interpretation of these, it is to suggest that God does not look at things like human beings look at them. And then the, the parables are help, to help us understand that these stories are not about the people that are in it, the shepherd and the woman who loses a coin. They're stories about God. Uh, you could encapsulate these stories in a little different way by saying, God is like the woman who lost the coin because. God is like the shepherd who sought the sheep, threw it over his shoulders, and brought it back to the sheepfold. That is what I think Jesus is trying to do. God is like this. God is like that. Parable of the lost son, we could call it, or the prodigal son, is a story not about the lost son. Everybody gets lost from time to time. It's not about the son that stays home and obeys his father and is ticked off because we see the father being lenient to this deadbeat brother of mine that ran off and partied, and, you know, did all kinds of unspeakable things that I don't want to speak about, so sit down and listen to me because I want to speak about it. No, it's a parable about what God is like. God is like a father who hikes up his robe when he sees the sun far off and he runs to embrace his son who was lost but now is found. That's what these parables are about. They're about somebody who was lost and somebody like God cared enough to go 
and uh, find them. The woman and the shepherd from the world's point of view are big fools. But from God's point of view, they're people that help the process of finding something that was uh, lost. <sighs> there used to be a pastor that, uh, that was in this church. His name was Travis Franklin. He passed away this year, as a matter of fact. But uh, he and I would do camp together uh, for senior highs at Glen Rose because neither one of us were brave enough to do it by ourselves. <laughs> and so in 1980, and some of you are old enough to remember that bitterly hot year, we did camp. And it was the only camp I was ever in where we told the kids after lunch, you have to go to your cabin, lay down on your bed for two hours. And the kids would all cheer because it was so hot, they didn't want to misbehave. I'm telling you, that is pretty darn hot, if you ask me. And uh, so I, I was the preacher for the week. A lot of times when, in the days when I was an effective preacher, I would go and, and, and preach at the camp. So um, I used this text one time, and I talked about the lost coin and, and the lost sheep and uh, after I got done there was a counselor that came up to me I guess at, at, in, at that time I was probably 35 and he was about 30 he said uh, preacher you know I was once that lost sheep and I said really do tell because I was interested in w what he had to say and he said well I've done a lot of things in my life that I wasn't proud of, and I lived in a little town, and everybody in my town and in my church knew some of the stuff that I was doing. And uh, they, of course, did not approve of it. And uh, I said, I, I, I always felt that God loved me, but I never felt like going to church and meeting the disapproval of the people that were in the church. And so I said, well, what'd you do? And he said, well, I finally decided that if I went back to church as a forgiven and redeemed person and the people in the church didn't accept me back, then they were the lost sheep and not me. Then he said, maybe you can use this story sometime. And I said, okay. I will. And I did. Amen. I want to... Uh, I had a bulletin around here a minute ago. There it is. I'd uh, like to uh, bless our offering as our ushers come forward to take up our offering. Let us pray. Gracious God, you have made us stewards of everything that we hold in trust. And so we would ask you, if you would, to bless the gifts that we are about to give and bless them in the powerful and the holy name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
I'd like to open the doors of the church this morning. If there's someone that would like to rededicate his or her life to Jesus Christ, I would invite you to come up here uh, to the communion rail. Or if you'd like to come and unite with this Salado United Methodist Church, make your pilgrimage of faith with this congregation, please feel free to come in as we sing our, uh, our final song cornerstone. Go now in peace. Amen. Amen. You guys have a great week.